Hey, how you doing? I'm Joshua Bishop. Today I'm going to be talking to you about some ideas I've been mulling over regarding the effect of radio waves, sound, and other types of radiation and vibration on human perception. I see a pattern emerging where some of these things might explain some of the strange experiences people report having uh, associated with the paranormal. First, let me give you a high-level overview of what the electromagnetic spectrum is and how sound waves work. If you are a physicist, an electrical engineer, or an acoustic technician, you will probably find um, some errors or mistakes in my description. Consider that my aim is to provide a conceptual overview so people can visualize these things and make connections rather than a deeply technical discussion. Feel free to make corrections in the comments in the spirit of clarification and uh, finding the truth. So first, what is radiation? Radiation is the divergence or spreading out from a central point, the emission of energy in the form of waves and or particles. The electromagnetic spectrum is a way of distributing or categorizing different types of radiation along a line based on frequency or wavelength. So wavelength, if you've ever looked at a, an image of a radio wave signal, it just looks like a series of squiggly lines, right? The wavelength is the measurement from the top of one wave to the top of the next wave. Whereas frequency is the number of waves that pass through a fixed location in an amount of time. So if you get one wave a minute, that's one frequency. If you get a thousand waves a minute, that's a different frequency, a higher frequency. Sort of like how fast the wave is. On the electromagnetic spectrum, there are many different types of radiation. Uh, everything from energy waves that propagate through the Earth at a very low frequency, to AC power that's moving along power lines and tall electric towers, the frequencies that are emitted by your computer monitor, your AM FM radio, cell phones, microwave ovens, all the way to how satellites communicate. Each of these different things uh, operate at a different range of frequencies. Extremely low frequency is anything from 1 hertz to 300 hertz. And a hertz is just a way of measuring uh, frequency, kind of like an inch or a mile. Waves made within the Earth, as well as AC power, fall into the category of extremely low frequency. Very high frequency is anything from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. And this is the range at which like older broadcast TV works. Extremely high frequency is 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. And this is where you start to approach microwaves. Frequencies above this is where light exists, including infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, and sunlight itself is on the electromagnetic spectrum. Sound waves are a bit different than radio waves in the sense that they are a pressure pushing through something like air rather than an energy propagating in a wave. Sound waves are more like waves in a pool radiating out from a drop stone. With sound waves, an object vibrates, like your voice box in your mouth. This vibrates the air around it, and as the vibration passes through the air, if it strikes an eardrum, the brain connected to that eardrum will interpret it as sound. When showing sound waves on paper, they are shown two-dimensionally as a squiggly line going along a straight line, up and down. But in reality, they are three-dimensional, expanding in a sphere from the center point where the sound was generated outward. Another difference between sound waves and radio waves is that while they are both depicted on a line with a wave, a squiggly line, in electromagnetics the peaks represent higher voltage and the valleys represent lower voltage. So, you know, how much energy is being put into the electromagnetic frequency. Versus in sound waves, the, the peaks are increased vibratory pressure, whereas the valleys are lower vibratory pressure. Um, so, you know, higher vibration sounds will hit your ears on the peak and lower ones on the valley. Now, something interesting in both sound and radio waves 
is that some frequencies are not perceptible to humans, to, to our senses. In sound, frequencies above 20 kilohertz cannot be heard in most cases. Uh, some people are extra sensitive and can hear a little bit higher than that, but in general, uh, those, those frequencies of sounds can't be heard, and these are called super audible or ultrasound. Frequencies below 20 hertz also cannot be heard and are called subaudible or infrasound. In radio waves, once you hit the light part of the spectrum, light that is flickering between 40 and 120 kilohertz is not perceivable by the human eye. So if the light is turning on and off or getting brighter and dimmer at that speed, your eye can't tell that anything is happening. Um, and the way that the human eye perceives different frequencies is taken advantage of by television and pictures. Infrared and ultraviolet frequencies also can't be seen by the eye, and most of the electromagnetic spectrum isn't perceivable by our senses. Radio waves pass through you and you don't even notice them. So that's a rough overview of radio and sound waves. Now I want to talk a little about something called destructive resonance, which I found completely fascinating. If the frequency of oscillations, and an oscillation is a movement back and forth, like when something is moved by a wave, when the frequency of oscillation matches its natural frequency of vibration, this can cause violent swaying motions and catastrophic failures. This is something that is considered by uh, architects and engineers when designing a building, a tower, or a bridge. Buildings in seismic zones with a lot of earthquake activity are constructed to take into account the oscillating frequencies of expected ground motion from earthquakes. When an engineer is designing a machine that has an engine, they must ensure that the resonant frequencies of the parts in the device, the car, or whatever it is, don't match the frequency of the motor or other oscillating parts, or else those parts can catastrophically fail. They might suddenly start like vibrating out of control or break or, or, or whatever. This effect is so intense that there have been many situations where soldiers marching across a bridge cause it to collapse because the, uh, their marching matches the resonant frequency of the bridge. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapsed in 1940 due to the oscillations caused by winds passing through its structure. Uh, and these winds happened to hit it at just the right frequency and made the bridge fall down. There have been several other major disaster examples of this phenomenon. Uh, there are ways of inducing uh, mechanical resonance and there are devices under patent that cause this effect. This can be done by vibration uh, or, you know, such as hitting a item repeatedly at a specific speed and frequency or by subjecting an object to uh, an alternating electric field there's different ways of causing this effect nikola tesla patented an electromagnetical uh, oscillator in 1893 and claimed that it caused an earthquake in new york city in 1898 there are also claims that it caused uh, physiological effects on people who were subject to its vibrations, uh, in some cases causing them to have to run to the bathroom. So I'm beginning to see a pattern. Waves in nature, whether they be radio, light, sound, or vibrations, have effects on what they touch, including humans. About 15 years ago, I was working on a project to make a computer generate a signal that could be detected by an instrument, but not by regular human senses. For example, uh, I would generate using software a signal through the screen using light that the person's eye couldn't see, but uh, a device like a special camera could see it. Or I could generate a sound through computer speakers that a person couldn't hear using uh, sub-audible or super-audible frequencies above or below the human range of hearing. During the course of this project, I discovered accidentally that I could make my coworkers nauseous or have a headache or other similar effects depending on what frequency I was using. Uh, one of my coworkers couldn't stand to be in the room when the, the sound frequency was being generated. He sensed it as like a physical pain in his ears. Uh, in other cases, coworkers, uh, if I put the the software that would change the light pattern in the computer screen, other coworkers wouldn't notice that anything was happening, but suddenly they would start to feel very ill and have to get up from their computer. 
In hindsight, this shouldn't have surprised me, but it did. At that same job, I experimented quite a bit with radio frequency signals of different types and got to work with some real geniuses in the field who taught me a lot. This began a long interest in the electromagnetic spectrum as well as how things move and behave through different mediums. A pebble dropped into a pool generates a wave that travels in all directions away from the point of contact, disturbing and moving a bee or a flower petal floating on the surface of the water. These phenomena really capture my imagination, and I've studied them both for work and as a hobby ever since. This now leads me to a field of study called cymatics. Cymatics uh, is a little bit controversial, but it involves testing the symmetrical patterns that are formed by applying different frequencies of vibration to different substances. For example, if you place particulates like sand or salt on a plate connected to an oscillator, which can produce different frequencies, images like mandalas or geometrical shapes will form out of the particles. What image is formed is controlled by the frequency of the vibration used. Some of these shapes look almost like human design patterns. They're, they're quite amazing, actually. I've even heard, I don't know if this is true, I haven't tested it myself, that if the phrase ohm is vibrated onto one of these cymatic um, experiments, that it will generate a pattern that matches the symbol for the word ohm. I don't know if that's true, but it's an interesting anecdote. Additional substances besides sand and salt have been experimented with, such as ferrofluid, which is like a magnetic fluid, uh, other magnetic materials, and something called non-Newtonian fluid, which is a fluid that changes viscosity depending on the amount of force applied. Some fluids will become nearly solid when struck or press pressed upon with enough force. Uh, these are considered non-Newtonian. So in Newtonian fluids, typically it maintains its viscosity no matter what's going on. So water is water until it, until it becomes ice. Whereas in non-Newtonian fluid, it would be as if water could suddenly become a solid just because you pressed upon it. If you apply uh, between 60 and 100 hertz to non-Newtonian fluid, it'll create these moving tentacle-like structures. This is a really fun experiment that you can easily do at home. Mix some cornstarch in water until the substance is pretty thick. You'll notice that if you lightly push into the mixture, it behaves like liquid still. But if you try to hit it or strike it or push it very fast, it will solidify and be hard. You won't be able to push through it. You can put this non-Newtonian fluid on a thin plate and then uh, like a, maybe a piece of aluminum or a, a very thin sheet of metal. And then if you place that on top of a speaker and use your computer to generate different frequency sounds starting at 60 hertz, you'll see these little like formations of tentacles rise up out of the mixture and move around like some sort of anime creature. Waves can also affect the material world, such as crystals. If you apply ultrasound to solutions used to create crystals, it'll change the size of the crystals that are formed and how they are distributed through the solution. You can also fragment the crystals this way. There have been st several studies showing uh, the effects on crystal solutions at different frequencies as well as on uh, substances within the body can be modified uh, using frequencies as well, similarly to crystals. Waves can also be used as weapons. In recent times, a company called Genesis created a weapon called a Long Range Acoustic Device, or LRAD. And the, the stated purpose of this was that it was for use in long range communications, but a lot of places where it's been applied is in what's called less than lethal crowd control. So for example, law enforcement might deploy an LRAD device at a uh, protest that looks like it's getting violent or becoming an out of control riot. The Academy of Doctors of Audiology stated that the use of the LRAD at the 2009 G2 summit for crowd control subjected people to a mild traumatic brain injury, permanent hearing loss, tinnitus, eardrum perforation, dizziness, and disorientation. The LRAD can also be used to broadcast audible messages over a long distance or to keep wildlife like birds away from airport runways. Uh, it essentially generates a, uh, a powerful acoustic wave in a specific direction or in a beam 
that uh, can affect people or, or different things. Now, I found this interesting when talking about <clears throat> wave weapons uh, because in between 1953 and 1976, a microwave transmission was detected between 2.5 and 4 gigahertz directed at the Embassy of the United States in Moscow. The microwave beam came from a source in an apartment building about 100 yards away from the embassy. The U.S. government, once they detected the signal, uh, installed shielding against the microwaves in the embassy. And then in 1975, uh, the signals were detected to have increased in intensity. So it seems like the Soviets were beaming microwaves into the embassy. When the U.S. discovered this, they tried to shield against it, and the Soviets then increased the level of uh, microwaves they were sending to try to get around the shielding. Some of the theories as to why the Soviets would do this include uh, triggering some sort of eavesdropping technology in the embassy. There are some listening devices that are passive, have no power source, but which can be powered by remotely passing energy through them. This is similar to how passive RFID tags work, like the kind you find in uh, things you buy at the store. They don't do anything until a reader passes a radio frequency wave through them. We'll talk a bit more about this type of technology in a, in a while. The next theory was that the Soviets were doing some kind of electronic jamming, trying to disrupt uh, technolo technology in use in the embassy. And the final theory was that it was an attempt to interfere with the health, minds, or behavior of the embassy staff. There was some indication in some of the things that I read that we may have had intelligence reporting that this was the goal. Another thing that the Russians did um, was to give a gift to the U.S. ambassador on August 4th, 1945. This gift was a wooden carved seal of the United States, and it was given to the ambassador by school children as a symbol of friendship. This seal hung in the ambassador's office for seven years. It turns out that the seal contained a device that was created at a secret laboratory in Russia by a guy named Leon Theremin, who also invented the weird-sounding Theremin musical instrument that used similar principles as this device. If you've heard it, the, the instrument sometimes used like on spooky movies to create like a weird wailing sound. All right, so the device that was in the seal that was put into the embassy um, was something called a passive resonant cavity, and it consisted of a quarter wavelength antenna connected to a small cylinder that was solid on one side, a thin capacitive membrane on the other side. The membrane acted as a microphone, uh, transmitting sounds at a slightly higher frequency. It didn't require any wires or power sources to transmit an audio signal. The device didn't become active until it was struck by the correct frequency in a process known as illuminating. So essentially the Russians would send a beam of energy at a specific frequency through the building. This beam would strike this little antenna looking device inside the seal. The seal would vibrate when people were speaking in the room and then transmit uh, what they were saying back towards the, the Soviets. Sound waves from voices inside the office pass through the wood case, striking the membrane, causing it to vibrate. The movement of the membrane change the capacitance seen by the antenna, which modulated the radio waves um, and were retransmitted by this thing. A receiver on the Soviet side would demodulate the signal so that the sound picked up by the microphone could be heard, just like a regular radio receiver. So the Russians in a building across the street from the embassy transmitted a signal and then they could hear what the ambassador was saying in the office, for example. And if you're uh, watching this video on YouTube or on one of the other video platforms, uh, I have some pictures of what this device looks like um, blown up in kind of like a design diagram. And you can see the different pieces that went into making the device. Around 1969, DARPA was given the task of analyzing the Russian microwave signal that had been detected in the embassy. They conducted testing on eight human subjects, subjecting them to the same signal and then evaluating them medically and psychologically. The uh, results that were reported were insignificant, but if you look at the papers, there are some interesting um, effects that were detected. In 1975, Ambassador Stossel began bleeding from the eyes and then died of leukemia. 
Henry Kissinger indicated in a statement that the illness was caused by the Soviet microwaves. So this seems to go against the results of the report that said that the effect was insignificant. In a paper released in 1998 by Anna Johnson Leocuris, the possibility of a neurotic syndrome including headache, ocular dysfunction, fatigue, dizziness, and sleep disorders was discussed. While experts in the U.S. discounted the paper, uh, Soviet medicine, like official Soviet health sources, add depression, irritability, and memory impairment, and considers the syndrome to be proven. The CIA had a Dr. Milton Zaret review the collected information about the microwave beam used at the embassy and concluded that the Russians believed that the beam would modify the behavior of embassy staff. As a result of this review, pay for the embassy staff was raised by 20% due to the hazards of working at the embassy. I found a paper which uh, had been published on the DOD.mil website but is now missing, so I had to pull it from the archive.org site. This paper outlines the procedures for something called Project Pandora, which was the classified at that time, now unclassified name, given to the project to test the, the Russian microwave sim signal. This paper came from the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and the project was worked on by DARPA, and then later passed to be conducted at Walter Reed Hospital. This project included several sub-studies, uh, one of which was named Project Bizarre. In Project Bizarre, they irradiated primates and monitored with electromagnetic energy and then monitored their ability to perform tasks. So they would have them do some task, hit them with different frequencies, especially the Russian microwave frequency, and then see, have them do the task again and see if there are any differences. In an ARPA director memo, the statement was made that the potential of exerting a degree of control on human behavior by low-level, selectively, selectively modulated microwave radiation should be investigated for potential weapons applications. To me, this says that uh, the director of ARPA at the time was taking this pretty seriously. Some of the doctors involved in Project Bazaar developed a method for remotely transmitting intelligible words by modulating microwaves. This paper can be found on the Wayback Machine of the Department of Defense website and it's called Operational Procedure for Project Pandora Microwave Test Facility. Some of the experiments were performed in an anacolic chamber, which is a room designed to stop reflections of either sound or electromagnetic waves. They're often isolated from energy entering from their surroundings. This combination means that a person or a detector exclusively hears direct sounds, no reflected sounds. These chambers can be any size and often look like a room covered in small triangular rubber cones. The chambers are also often Faraday cages, which don't allow any signals to go in or out of the chamber. As it turns out, I've been in several of these chambers. Uh, one large one when I was working for aircraft manufacturers on the security of signals emitted from onboard systems they were building. And another time in a small room-like chamber that I was using for some cell phone projects I was working on. These chambers are very weird. Uh, if you're inside of one and you speak, uh, sounds are very strange and flat and not normal. And after a while, your head starts to feel pretty weird being, being inside one of these chambers. Some other highlights from this DoD paper include uh, that the project was considered high urgency by ARPA. A research facility was established at Walter Reed for observing biological effects from these frequencies. This facility had a photo lab a neurochemistry lab, a neurophysiology lab, a behavior lab, etc. Effects from the signal were demonstrated on primates, although there were some questions as to the um, testing conditions and how that might have affected the, the study. Shifts in behavior were detected under 7 hertz fields. Within the document that I found on archive.org, there are different sections some are letters of people commenting on the report. There's a lot of diagrams and like collected data tables. And then there's conclusions and, uh, you know, write-ups of the different things that were seen. A study that I found on the NIH library publication site uh, showed cognitive effects in mice affecting their memory. 
Uh, the study also showed that exposure to high frequency magnetic fields can improve memory. So not all the effects are negative. Some, some of the effects that have been found are positive and it all seems to depend on the frequencies that are used, the power levels, if the frequencies are pulsed, what, what speed is the pulse done at. Another paper on the NIH website discussed how low frequency noise at work can affect human cognition. And a third study I found on the same site discusses headaches, tremors, dizziness, loss of memory, concentration, and sleep disturbance due to RF exposure. 1800 megahertz was used in this particular study. And this study cited several uh, epidemiological studies. It also stated that um, changes in the blood-brain bar barrier were observed in rats when exposed to 2.4 gigahertz, which is the same as the Wi-Fi frequency band. So some of these results seem to verify what the Russians say and go against what uh, other experts have said. The information out there on this is a bit contradictory and confusing. I found another paper uh, published by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that outlines the effects of different frequencies on humans and animals, including auditory perception, behavioral changes, fatigue, concentration difficulties, headaches, irritability. You see a pattern here from all these different studies. And some of the frequencies that were tested in this paper were microwave ranges pulsed at less than a second, uh, 0.2 to 8 gigahertz pulsed, 3.75 kilohertz, 50 hertz, all the way up to microwave levels, and uh, 60 hertz. And cephalo Electroencephalographic changes in cats and rabbits were reported from exposure to 147 megahertz fields, as well as from 1 to 10 megahertz fields. Electroencephalography, otherwise known as EEG, is a method to record uh, an electrogram of the electrical activity on the scalp. And this has been used to represent the macroscopic activity of the surface layer of the brain underneath. Essentially, you can measure um, electricity on the scalp and have some understanding of what's happening in the brain. Uh, this same paper also states that a special effect has been reported in which uh, microwave RF emitted in the form of very short pulses is perceived as humans and animals as clicks or other sounds. The auditory perception of pulsed microwave fields was first reported in 1947 and has been studied extensively. Uh, Dr. Frey reported on controlled experimental exposures at frequencies of 0.2 to 8.9 gigahertz. He found that depending on the characteristics of the field, sensations were perceived as buzzing, ticking, hissing, or knocking sounds. Uh, another doctor named Guy demonstrated that the threshold for audio perception was four times higher at 3.7 kilohertz in subjects with neurosensory deficits compared with normal subjects. This indicates that the effect may be in the acoustic elements involved in hearing. So to kind of simplify that a little bit, there's some indication that when you're, if you're being hit by some of these frequencies, it might actually change the temperature of parts of the ear, which then changes kind of what you're hearing and what you're perceiving. One time my wife and I were at a place called Echo Canyon Amphitheater in New Mexico near Ghost Ranch. And there was nobody around. This place is kind of in the middle of nowhere in the desert. And suddenly it sounded like all of the plants, rocks, ground, like everything around was crackling like a high power overhead electrical wire. We couldn't figure out the source of this sound and it seemed to be coming from everywhere that we went. Uh, it makes me wonder if maybe there was some kind of a microwave source in the area although we didn't really see anything, no buildings, no people. There is also an effect known as the Frey effect after Dr. Frey, or microwave auditory effect, which consists of the human perception of audible clicks or even speech induced by pulsed or mod modulated radio frequencies. The communications are generated directly inside of the human head without the need of any receiving device. This effect was first reported by persons working in the vicinity of radar transponders during World War II. Uh, in 1961, Dr. Frey studied this phenomenon and published information on it. So it seems like with certain frequencies, you can actually cause people to hear uh, speech in their heads.
1975, an article by neuropsychologist Don Justinson discussed radiation effects on human perception and referred to an experiment by Joseph Sharp and Mark Grove at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, during which Sharp and, Gro and Grove reportedly were able to recognize 9 out of 10 words transmitted by voice-modulated microwaves. Uh, since the radiation levels were uh, close to the limit of safe exposure, critics observed that under such conditions, brain damage from thermal effects of high-power microwave radiation could occur, and that there was no evidence for this effect at lower densities. So really what this means is, in order to make it to where someone could hear something from a um, microwave broadcast, essentially, the power has to be so high it might actually damage your body. Epidemiologic studies of groups of people occupationally or environmentally exposed to electromagnetic fields in the RF and ELF range have yielded uh, perceptual and behavior responses, basically all of the same sorts of uh, effects that we've talked about previously. And uh, there's a lot of studies in Eastern Europe that investigated this, especially from 50 hertz all the way up to microwave frequencies. And they talk about how um, the test subjects complain of insomnia, uh, loss of memory. Uh, in Russia, they identify this syndrome as neurasthenia or microwave sickness. One interesting study um, stated that 60 hertz electric fields have been reported to affect the social behavior of baboons. The investigators used a number of measures of social behavior, but found that tension, um, passive affinity, and stereotypical behavior were significantly changed in exposed groups. The authors suggested that the changes might indicate a stress response to the electric fields. Uh, one interesting thing is that the... the um, Standard refresh rate for a computer monitor is also 60 hertz. But what does all this have to do with the paranormal? To answer that, first we have to look a little bit at infrasound. Uh, things that can cause infrasound include meteors entering the atmosphere, earthquakes, auroras, volcanic eruptions, and anything that can generate like a very low, uh, sort of a deep frequency sound. Many nations have infrasound detection arrays in which devices are placed on the ground. They kind of look like big spider webs or big spiders, and they try to detect changes in infrasound. Some of these are used to detect nuclear weapons detonations at a distance. Underwater ocean noise, such as that created by shipping, military activities, naval sonar signals, uh, pile driving, are being studied for physical and physiological effects. Um, chronic stress, things like this. They're looking at sea creatures to see if uh, these underwater sounds are causing changes in them. And they are finding um, some evidence of that. Like uh, whales have changed the way that they communicate the frequency at which they make sounds in some cases and their behavior has changed. Interestingly enough, the Nazis created a sound gun we weapon. I think you pronounce it the Schall cannon. I don't speak German, so I don't know how to say that word. Uh, it was supposed to produce high-frequency waves designed to burst the eardrums of en enemy soldiers. Uh, the Nazis' infrasound performed experiments on prisoners, which caused them to panic, feel dizziness, pain in their organs, and other effects. They tried to harness this effect as an acoustic gun, but they did not succeed. So I guess the... Uh, Genesis Corporation succeeded many years later. There have been some stu studies that have shown that infrasound or low frequency sound waves can cause phenomenon that people associate with ghosts or other paranormal activities. This includes feelings of nervousness and discomfort as well as a sense of a presence in the room. The sound waves may also vibrate the human eye causing people to see things that aren't there. Usually these waves have a frequency of less than 20 hertz so they are too low pitch for people to actually hear, you know, like we've discussed previously. Rather than noticing the sound itself, people notice its effects. Psychologist Richard Wiseman of the University of Hertfordshire suggests that the odd sensations people attribute to ghosts may actually be caused by infrasonic vibrations. Uh, Vic Tandy and Dr. Tony Lawrence of Coventry University Psychology Department wrote in a 1998 paper called Ghosts in the Machine, and they suggested that an infrasonic signal of 19 hertz might be responsible for some ghost sightings. The, the reason why they came up with this idea is that 
one night Tandy was working late alone in the laboratory and this laboratory was kind of known around the university for being haunted. He suddenly started feeling anxious and saw a gray blob out of the corner of his eye. When he turned to look, there was nothing there. The next day he was back in the lab and he was a uh, avid fencer. He liked sword fighting. And so he was doing some work on his fencing foil, uh, which he had held in a vise in the lab. Nothing was touching it and suddenly the blade started to vibrate wildly. He discovered that uh, a fan in the lab was emitting a frequency of 18.98 hertz. Now NASA has stated that the resonant frequency of the human eye is 18 hertz, so it's pretty close. What Tandy believed he had experienced was an optical illusion caused by his eyeballs resonating from the frequency emitted by the fan. The room was exactly half a wavelength uh, in length for that 18 hertz, and the desk was in the center, which he believed caused a standing wave that caused the foil to vibrate. So, you know, in, in some cases, one of the things that I've seen ghost hunters do is if they're in a place like a bar or a house that's known to be haunted, they'll take measurements of like the uh, light fixtures or even electrical plugs to see if they seem to be leaking EMF uh, because there's a belief that certain EMF frequencies like sound frequencies can cause the same effects that uh, Tandy saw in his lab. Now let's take a look at the uh, something that's been in the news re recently called the Havana Syndrome. The Havana Syndrome is a set of medical symptoms with unknown causes experienced mostly overseas by U.S. government officials and military personnel. This syndrome involves a uh, pain and ringing in the ears, cognitive difficulties, basically uh, effects very similar to what we've discussed previously. This was first reported in 2016 by U.S. and Canadian embassy staff in Havana, Cuba. Since then, the symptoms have been reported in other places like China, Europe, Washington, D.C. Uh, the CIA director, William Burns, caused them attack, called them attacks. A neuroimaging study that was performed of 40 diplomats who have experienced this syndrome, found significant brain differences. An expert committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine concluded that microwave energy, specifically directed pulsed RF energy, appears to be the most plausible mechanism in explaining these cases among those that they tested. All right, the next thing I'm gonna talk about may seem like a tangent, but bear with me for a moment. There's something called Van Eyck monitoring. This is a form of eavesdropping performed by picking up what are called sideband electromagnetic emissions from electronic devices like keyboards, computer displays, printers, etc. So essentially, most electronic devices are leaking small amounts of electromagnetic radiation. The attacker can pick up these signals, these leaks, and then recreate them in order to uh, view screen images or keystrokes or things like that. Information that drives a video display on a computer monitor takes the form of high frequency electrical signals. These oscillating electric currents create electromagnetic radiation in the radio frequency range. These radio emissions are correlated to the video image being displayed, so they can be used to recover the displayed image. One of the problems with this is that you have to be relatively close to the target in order to pick up this leaking energy. Presumably, uh, places like embassies know this, and have taken steps to prevent this from pushing fence lines out to a larger distance to shielding equipment and rooms, etc. According to several papers that I read, unintended emissions can be stimulated to increase their detectability by 5 to 10 dB, which is a unit of measurement for RF strength. I read one paper on detecting and locating explosive devices where they stimulated these signals using radar or microwaves in order to boost their detectability. Is it possible someone is transmitting microwaves into buildings in order to enhance Van Eyck freaking distances? Could this explain Havana syndrome? Uh, radar, radio detection and ranging, is a detection system that uses radio waves to determine the distance, range, angle, or velocity of objects. Most radars operate between 400 megahertz and 36 gigahertz. I, uh, I found a retracted study on the NIH library uh, that said that 100 workers were exposed to radar radiations between 14 and 18 gigahertz. Uh, 
Uh, 20 to 39 percent of the radar workers reported different problems such as needing a good tonic, I'm not sure what that means, feeling run down out of sorts, headache, tightness or pressure in the head, insomnia, uh, getting edgy and bad tempered. Furthermore, 47 percent of the radar workers reported feeling under strain. In response to this question that was asked, which was, have they been able to enjoy their normal day-to-day -day activities, 31% of them responded that less than usual. It was also shown that work experience had uh, significant relationships with reaction time and short-term memory indices. So it seems like there are several documented effects of radar on people's behavior, the way they feel, uh, their thought processes. All right, so now for a bit of fun trivia. The TV show Stranger Things appears to be loosely based on some alleged activities that occurred in the past uh, in Montauk at a place called Camp Hero. Montauk is a village at the east end of the Long Island Peninsula. Camp Hero is a former military coastal defense station that was disguised as a fishing village and was designed to prevent invasion of New York from the sea. It had multiple gun batteries, concrete bunkers, a large radar installation, and uh, other things you would expect at that type of facility. It's only about an hour and a half from Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is run by the Department of Energy and studies nuclear and high energy physics, bioscience, nanoscience, and national security. In the show Stranger Things, the girl named Eleven is taken to a secret underground laboratory, held captive, subjected to sensory deprivation, as well as unspecified radio sequences to her skull. Uh, in the TV show, strange paranormal events ensue from this. At Montauk, uh, in real life, there are stories of kidnappings and people being subjected to strange experiments at Camp Hero. Uh, a friend of mine who's a, a professional that works for one of the large um, three-letter health agencies uh, mentioned that he was aware of this when he lived in that area back in the past, uh, that there was a lot of discussion of like homeless kids and orphans going missing. Uh, Camp Hero is also the site of a powerful SAGE radar tower that operates up to 425 megahertz. Since radar is essentially a type of microwave and microwaves can affect cognition, it's convenient that Camp Hero contains a large microwave installation. There are a lot of stories and conspiracy theories that you can find on the internet about uh, the types of experiments that were done at Camp Hero. Um, there's very little official documented information corroborating this, but it is interesting. So the pattern that I am seeing is that in many cases, individuals that could have been exposed to microwaves, electronics leaking, electromagnetic radiation or infrasound uh, coming from malfunctioning devices or other sources may have changes in their perception that lead them to believe they're experiencing something paranormal, like seeing ghosts. In some cases, this effect may be induced by military or government weapons, or is an inadvertent side effect to other uh, types of technical activities. And that's about it for today. So if you like this podcast, please generate a pressure wave with your hand on that like button. Consider sharing it. And if you like, you can donate to my Patreon to help keep this show going. Thanks, and see you on the next episode.